For years, we had sailed our sailboat Winter Sea among the waters of British Columbia, Washington State and Alaska. These are among the best cruising areas of the world, and they abound with wonderful archipelagos of islands and tranquil anchorages. But now we set our sights further afield, with a planned voyage down the west coast of the Americas. After a final cruise in our home waters, and a farewell to some of our favourite haunts, Winter Sea had to be prepared for the task. We had to get her out of the water, much easier nowadays with the use of these special marine lifts, making easy work of lifting Wintersea's 20 tons onto dry land and propping her up for a few days while the work was completed. This is a manoeuvre that those unused to boating are always surprised to see. Seen here, the worst of the accumulated undersea slime algae and barnacles are removed with this high-pressure hose. Then the hull below the waterline has to be painted with a special anti-fouling paint to prevent the build-up of the living organisms like barnacles and weeds, which are happy to find a home on the hull. This was particularly important since we were heading south into warmer waters where the problems of sea life growing on the hull get much worse. We sailed for a few more final days on the lovely protected waters of British Columbia. We were not to see them for several years. And we were to discover that these waterways, islands and anchorages of the Pacific Northwest are the equal of any in the world. Still, we were anxious to get further afield and the thought of the high seas drew us on. At last, the weather turned and we found ourselves out on the mighty Pacific Ocean Little did we know that the further west we sailed, the more mighty and less pacific the ocean became. But that is another story for another film. The sailing down the west coast of Washington State, Oregon and Northern California was magnificent. We had a brisk wind from the northwest and the seas were moderate. We made rapid progress. We were very excited during the first few days. After all the months of planning, here we were out on the ocean, with all our land-based ties cut, and the whole world was ahead of us to be discovered. After a day or two, the winds and seas picked up, but with sail reduced, winter sea was reveling in it. With reefed sails carefully balanced, the boat virtually sailed herself. The autopilot was switched on to keep the boat on course without having to stand at the wheel all the time, and the solar panels were charging to keep up with the power demands of the autopilot's motor. We were making great progress towards California. After a final long dark night sailing, with the powerful light of Point Reyes Lighthouse in California guiding us to our planned destination, we dropped anchor to sleep soundly before awakening to see this lovely sight. We had arrived in Drake's Bay, in the shelter of Point Reyes, a peninsula jutting out into the ocean, which makes this a rare protected anchorage on the Pacific coast of California. The wind was still brisk, but the seas were calm as we looked out at other anchored boats under the blue California sky. Drake's Bay is named after Sir Francis Drake, the great navigator of Elizabethan times, who anchored here during his circumnavigation of the world and made it a base to harass Spanish shipping and to raid Spanish colonial ports. We rested here for a day before setting off on our final leg towards San Francisco. Leaving the shelter of Drake's Bay, within a few hours we passed Point Benita Lighthouse, which guards the shipping approaches to the narrow entrance of San Francisco Bay. And then we saw it, the iconic Golden Gate Bridge spanning the entrance to the bay. This was a moment we had waited for with great anticipation for a very long time. And there it was, with the top of its tower shrouded in the San Francisco summer fog. 
How often we had seen this bridge in photographs and movies, and here we were approaching it from the sea. I was jumping up and down with adolescent excitement. Hearing the rattling and roaring of the road traffic on the bridge above our heads reminded us that we were now back in so-called civilization after being several days and nights at sea. I was surprised at the lack of shipping in the approaches and entrance to San Francisco Bay. After all, San Francisco and Oakland, further in across the enclosed bay, are among the busiest ports on the west coast of the United States but there was not a single big ship to be seen. There's Alcatraz, I shouted to Linda, and there it was. Alcatraz was named La Isla de los Alcatraces, or the Island of the Pelicans, by Captain Ayala in 1755, as he charted and explored this region on behalf of the Spanish government. We docked the boat in the marina district, quite close to the entrance to San Francisco Bay. I had been to San Francisco before, but had never arrived by boat, and it was certainly a memorable day. The bay is large and very impressive. The weather and skies are curious, though. In summer, unexpectedly in California, it can often be foggy and overcast. When one looks towards the Golden Gate Bridge and the open Pacific, the sky is heavy and gloomy. However, by turning the other way towards the east, the sky becomes blue, the sun shines and the sea sparkles. Much more like the popular vision of California. We were looking forward to exploring this very exciting area. Across the bay, there is the town of Sausalito, with its gardens and hundreds of houseboats. And in that whole area of Northern California, north of San Francisco Bay, are the 400 or so vineyards, which make up the huge wine-producing areas of the Napa and Sonoma Valleys. We would not manage to see them all, perhaps, but we would try to taste at least some of the vintages of a few of them. There are many thousands of sailboats in the Bay Area, and many of them are on the water every day. The winds are often very brisk and changeable on the Bay, and sailing is always fun and often a great challenge. Alcatraz dominates the centre of San Francisco Bay. It has fulfilled many purposes in its time. It was a military base and a military prison during the American Civil War. But it was its time as a US federal prison that has made it so famous. Its position in the middle of the bay, surrounded by cold, turbulent waters with rapidly changing currents, made it a perfect place for a high security prison. During its 30 years use to 1963, it housed many famous notorious prisoners. The most notable was the egregious syphilitic Alphonse Al Capone, who was imprisoned in the end, not because of the many murders he was responsible for, but for tax evasion. Wintersea became our floating hotel for a nice long bout of tourism in San Francisco. The location was perfect and the sea views excellent. We explored this lovely city on foot, by the famous cable cars, by bus and even by taxi. It's a city as varied as it is spectacular. We could walk for hours along the seafront near our dock, along the old Embarcadero, and wildlife abounded, even within sight and sound of heavy traffic. The commercial ship traffic of San Francisco has largely gone. The great days when the city was perhaps the busiest port on the west coast, with scores of great ships lined up along its docks and quaysides, are over. There is still a port, but it is less busy, and it has largely moved further south and east, deeper into the bay. 
Now, at the spectacular north end of the city, facing the bay and Alcatraz, the boating is mainly recreational, with marinas, like the one that we're docked at, and tourist boats going to Angel Island and Alcatraz. The other event that changed the seafront of San Francisco was the decision to remove the two-decked freeway that ran along the whole of the Embarcadero seafront after it was badly damaged in the 1989 earthquake. With the removal of the freeway, the whole seafront has become a much more people-friendly space, with shops and restaurants and parks lying in the boulevards created when the freeway came down. The ugly barrier between the city and its seafront had gone. These amusing birds, the pelicans, are everywhere in California. They live in large flocks and they often cooperate with each other to catch fish. Pelicans have been around for millions of years and, looking at them, they must have been designed by a committee. A lazy day out on the bay. When people go near the sea, they are always excited to see wildlife like this seal. However, in San Francisco, there are three or four times more sea lions than seals. So, in San Francisco, it's safer to say, oh, that's a sea lion. Well, this one is a seal, because it does not have little flaps over its ears. Sea lions do. This is the Palace of Fine Arts, the only remaining building from the Panama Pacific International Exposition. This World's Fair was held between February and December 1915, and its ostensible purpose was to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal. It had only been intended to stand for the duration of the World's Fair and was not built of durable materials. It had been made of a kind of burlap covered with plaster. People had wanted it saved, but over the decades it fell into a crumbling, decrepit state. In 1964 it was again demolished, but rebuilt in poured concrete. Its romantic appearance, with a design loosely based on ancient Greek and Roman styles, it is a favourite place for weddings and wedding photographs, and it houses a museum and theatre. It has become a favourite San Francisco tourist attraction, a brand new ancient ruin. The sea lions at Pier 39 have been a tourist attraction for many years, in spite of the smell. After the earthquake of 1989, sea lions began to gather here and in large numbers. At one point, at the end of September 2009, there were over 1,100 of them, mostly male. Then they disappeared. Had their food supply disappeared? Nobody knows. However, since then they come and they go. Sometimes there are large numbers and sometimes none at all. And yes, these really are sea lions. They have the flaps over the ears to prove it. The steep streets of San Francisco, the parks, the grand views of the bay from every part of the city, the fish restaurants, the cable cars. Our next port of call was here in Monterey, California, a bustling, prosperous town with a brisk tourist industry and the upmarket community of Carmel and the swanky Pebble Beach golf course nearby. Monterey is forever associated with that great American writer, John Steinbeck, who wrote novels set here in Monterey, including Canary Row, and who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1962. He came to Monterey and met people later immortalized in his books, and he became a regular fixture on the Monterey scene. One of the other great men associated with Monterey was Edward Ricketts, a marine biologist and early green ecologist who founded a marine biology laboratory here in Monterey. Ricketts was immortalized in Cannery Row and other books as Doc, and he became a leading figure in the world of marine biology. He died at the age of only 51 in 1948. 
Fortunately, Doc Ricketts' work is continued to this day in the laboratories of the world-famous Monterey Bay Aquarium. On exploring this remarkable aquarium, with its many huge tanks, which can be observed from many different levels, above, below and from the side, we can only be amazed at the beauty and variety of life below the ocean surface. Here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they've gone to great lengths to present life in the ocean as it really exists in the great bodies of water of the world. The towering sea plants, or kelp, the huge number and variety of fishes and other marine life are remarkable. These kelp forests are displayed in an aquarium 28 feet deep, one of the deepest displays in the world, and the kelp grows at the rate of 4 inches a day. Hidden among the kelp forests are giant Pacific octopuses, tiny seahorses, turtles and a vast spectrum of colours among the tropical fish. There are enormous tanks with great white sharks, schools of barracuda and several varieties of tuna. Some of the most beautiful displays are in a darkened grotto with large aquaria on either side filled with the most exotic jellyfish, beautifully and softly lit, so that the jellyfish pulse, glow, dance and bloom and sting in the subdued light. This vast aquarium is a treasure trove of undersea wonders. There are displays of amphibians, birds such as penguins, marine mammals like sea otters. There are plants and algae. All of them are cleverly and magnificently displayed. On progressing around this place, one could not help but think about the reality of the oceans of today. The oceans account for over two-thirds of the Earth's surface, and it used to be thought that they had an infinite capacity to absorb any and all pollutants. After all, the amount of water in the oceans was so vast that it would always be able to dilute away any pollutants allowed to get into it. But the truth is different. Mankind has used the oceans as a dump site for thousands of years. Dumping waste into the sea is a cheap and easy and quick way to dispose of almost anything. And it's practically untraceable. Plastic junk dumping and pesticide and fertilizer runoff from the land have all had a major effect on the health of the sea. Fertilizer runoff, for example, leads to exuberant growth of algae and other microorganisms which use up all of the oxygen in the water, causing great dead zones in the ocean when nothing at all can live. Global warming and climate change have greatly affected the health of the sea. Oceans are warming and, as they do, some animals and plants will adapt, but many will not. Carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere leads to the carbon dioxide absorption into the sea, making it more acidic. This affects every living thing from tiny plankton to salmon and whales. Ocean currents change with the melting of the polar ice caps, and so does the availability of food for plants, animals, and people. The need to make people more aware of ocean pollution and global warming and climate change as affecting the lives of all plants and animals, including people, is front and centre of all activities here in this wonderful aquarium. Our next stop was in Morro Bay, a beautifully enclosed, protected anchorage with a narrow, dangerous entrance. We entered the bay in grand style, personally escorted by an American Coast Guard vessel. Leaving the boat in the safety of Morro Bay, we visited the magnificent Hearst Castle, high on a hill overlooking the Pacific at San Simeon. Hearst Castle was planned and built by the American newspaper tycoon, William Randolph Hearst. From about 1920, he spent the last 30 years of his life planning, building, and often rebuilding, this extraordinary creation on the hilltop at San Simeon. He had inherited this huge tract of land from his mother, 
It comprised of 250,000 acres of barren rolling hills with miles and miles of shoreline. And for years, Hurst and his family would camp on their land by the sea. He loved this place, close to the community of San Simeon, but with his increasing wealth, he wished to spend more comfortable time there. In about the year 1915, Hurst approached a successful woman architect called Julia Morgan and asked her to design a modest bungalow on the hilltop. For many reasons, the plans for the bungalow soon escalated into something more grand. This Roman temple facade by the outdoor so-called Jupiter pool is an actual real Roman temple that Hearst had packed up and shipped back to California. Some modest bungalow. The outside of the buildings had elements of Greek, Roman, Byzantine and Spanish styles. If Hearst liked a particular style, it was included in the design. This was Hearst's own bedroom. His love of heavy, dark Spanish furniture is very clear. This no less heavily furnished bedroom and sitting room was that of his mistress, Marion Davis, a Hollywood film starlet whose career was made, and some say destroyed, by her long association with Hearst. They had a daughter together who was always subsequently introduced as Marion Davis's niece. It is said that his time here in her boudoir enabled Hearst to escape the stern pressures of the business world. Well, yes. This is an ordinary guest bedroom in which some of the most famous Hollywood film stars, world statesmen and powerful business figures would have stayed. It was often said that the reason why Hearst made San Simeon so large was that it enabled him to empty out several large warehouses of all the art treasures that he had accumulated over the years. He needed somewhere to display them. Hearst had been a great traveller and collector and his tastes were eclectic. He bought widely and in great quantities and often competed with art galleries, museums and other wealthy collectors to get the best of the best. And if he could not get the original, then he would hire the best contemporary artists to reproduce it. This room, with its large collection of beautifully bound books, ancient and modern, its collection of ancient Roman and Greek pottery on the shelves above the bookcases, said to be one of the best private collections in the world, its intricately carved ceiling and its heavy but comfortable furniture was the nerve centre of Hearst's empire when he was in residence. In this room, he critically read every one of the publications he owned. He did this every day after their delivery in one of his own airplanes to the landing strip down by the sea. The executives of the Hearst Corporation were regularly summoned to San Simeon to attend to some problem or other, and regular board meetings were held in this elegant room. Hearst, together with his architect, Julia Morgan, had conceived La Cuesta Encantada, or the Enchanted Hilltop, as they called it, as an Italian hilltop town by the sea. It consisted of the main house, La Casa Grande, modelled on a Spanish cathedral, and three smaller guest houses. There were about 60 bedrooms and about as many bathrooms. Everything was sumptuously appointed. Guests were treated like royalty, and many of the world's elite and famous were entertained here. Hearst was not a great drinker, however, and although his newspapers campaigned against prohibition, he did not encourage drinking amongst his guests. One of the guests, the famous British film star David Niven, complained that during dinner the wine flowed like glue. However, the wine that did flow was of the very best. If the drink did not flow freely, there were plenty of other consolations. Both of the huge swimming pools were heated and comfortable, and this, the Roman pool, was an almost exact copy of a pool in ancient Rome. 
there were eight larger-than-life-size statues copied by contemporary leading sculptors from original Greek and Roman statuary. When looking at scenes of conspicuous consumption like these at San Simeon, it is difficult to understand how the heyday of Hearst Castle could have been during the times of extreme poverty and want during the Great Depression of the 1930s. With this last glimpse of San Simeon, the Enchanted Hill, we are reminded with relief that following the years of almost obscene luxury, the castle and its lands were given by the Hearst Corporation to the citizens of California so that all could see and enjoy this extraordinary place. After leaving Morro Bay, we headed south, turned left around Point Conception, and came into this peaceful anchorage at Coho Bay, protected from the big swells of the Pacific by Point Conception itself. The left turn here, to go east into the Santa Barbara Channel, is what a great squadron of US Navy destroyers missed, quite spectacularly, on the 8th of September 1923. These 14 ships were all in a line behind the flagship USS Delphi, steaming along at full speed in poor weather and low visibility. The navigator decided it was time to turn left into the Santa Barbara Channel, a couple of miles too early. Seven ships ran aground, one after the other in line, and were lost. Two others ran aground lightly and were able to save themselves. 23 sailors lost their lives and many promising naval careers were ruined. It all happened right here. Whoops. Santa Barbara is one of the most beautiful towns that we visited during our voyage down the west coast of the United States. The city lies between the steeply rising Santa Ines Mountains and the Pacific Ocean and has a very benign climate much like the Mediterranean and is often called the American Riviera. As with most of this coast, the first Europeans here were the Portuguese and Spanish explorers in the 16th century. But in 1602, the Spanish sailor Sebastian Vizcaino gave the name Santa Barbara to the region in gratitude for having survived a violent storm in the channel here on December the 3rd, the eve of the feast of St. Barbara. The most dramatic event in the Spanish period of Santa Barbara's history was the powerful earthquake and tsunami which destroyed the original mission and most of the town in 1812. At that time, the tidal wave damaged buildings far inland and carried a large ship several miles from the sea. Following the earthquake, the mission fathers chose to build higher up, away from the sea, in a much grander manner. This building is the Santa Barbara County Courthouse and it has been described as the most beautiful public building in the United States. It was opened in 1929 and is built on the site of an earlier courthouse which was destroyed by an earthquake in 1925. This earthquake had no tsunami but was the most destructive California earthquake since the one in San Francisco in 1906 and killed about 14 people. The town already had a strong Spanish colonial flavour, but this 1925 quake gave the town further opportunity to unify the whole community under the same architectural style. This building, the 1929 courthouse, has a large room on the walls of which are murals depicting the whole history of Santa Barbara. This history, particularly in modern times, has been quite surprising. English only supplanted Spanish as the principal language here as late as 1870 and during the California Gold Rush the town became a haven for gamblers, bandits and various other lawless characters. There was even a resident highway robber called Jack Powers who contributed to all of the nefarious activities there and controlled the place. He was eventually driven out of town, murdered in Mexico and his body fed to a pen of starving pigs. Just before the turn of the 20th century, oil was discovered and exploited near the town, and just offshore there popped up a number of drilling rigs. Surprisingly too, Santa Barbara housed the world's largest movie studio during the era of silent films, 
and over a thousand productions were made here up until 1922 when the industry moved to the larger center of Hollywood, Los Angeles. Furthermore, early airplanes were made by the Lockheed Company here in the early 20th century when seaplanes were regularly tested off the beach. Now Santa Barbara is more sedate but quietly prosperous. Its major industry now is the collection of universities and colleges around town. Quite a change over the years. Mission Santa Barbara's name comes from the legendary Saint Barbara, a girl who, allegedly, was beheaded by her father for following the Christian faith. The Franciscan priests established a chain of missions in Upper and Lower California, Mission Santa Barbara being the ninth to be built. The inside of the church is much as it was in 1820. Only the towers were badly damaged in the 1925 earthquake, and they were subsequently rebuilt. When Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1832, all the missions in the new sovereign state were secularized, only to be restored back to the Catholic Church in March 1865 by President Abraham Lincoln. This mission, over the years, has been a school, a, a cathedral for a vast Catholic diocese, a choir college, and a seminary to train new priests. It remains a tranquil place for a quiet, contemplative visit. High on this hill, overlooking the city of Los Angeles, which was our next and largest ever port of call, is the Getty Center. Getty was that most curious of human hybrids, a miser and philanthropist. On the one hand, he knew and jealously guarded every one of his billions of dollars. On the other hand, he gave huge amounts of money to his Getty Foundation, which has built and operated two wonderful art museums, like this one, which are entirely admission-free. These museums are visited by millions of visitors every year. I love the juxtaposition of these two pieces. Isn't it wonderful? how the one short, stocky form within a few years grows into the beautiful tall figure of the mature man. It's possible here to see examples of virtually every major artist in history, and all for free. One cannot help comparing the attitudes towards their fellow human beings of the two men whose worldly manifestations we have seen on this voyage. On the one hand, we saw the sumptuous palace at San Simeon that William Randolph Hearst built entirely for his own pleasure. He was no miser, but he didn't give much away either. On the other hand, here at the Getty Museum, we can see how J. Paul Getty did not try to take it all with him, but gave these beautiful institutions to his fellow human beings for them to share in his own good fortune. Hearst was one of the one percent. Getty was not. From here on Getty's hilltop, we look across Los Angeles towards Hollywood, Tinseltown. This part of Los Angeles has gone down in the world in the last few decades, and it's become a bit tacky. No movies are made here anymore, most being made on location everywhere in the world. However, to appeal to tourists, they continue to put these so-called Walk of Fame plaques on the sidewalks of Old Hollywood, and they still have tours of the homes of whatever stars still live in Beverly Hills. Mostly, it's people like wealthy plastic surgeons and pizza parlor tycoons who live there now. Of course, there's always Grauman's Chinese Theater that still has occasional world premieres of movies. We left Marina del Rey in Los Angeles to cross to the dry desert islands called the Channel Islands, 20 miles or so off the coast of Southern California. After anchoring for a night or two at some very quiet smaller islands, one with a huge mature olive grove, we arrived here at Avalon Bay on Catalina Island to find that this cruise ship had beaten us to it. However, there were other moorings 
and we found our spot here nestled among literally hundreds of other boats. We had never before been in such a crowded anchorage. To escape the crowded anchorage of Avalon Bay, we moved a few miles up the coast of Catalina Island to another, we hoped, less crowded place where we could perhaps relax in more peace and quiet. We arrived at two harbours, a pair of small bays at either side of a narrow isthmus, one bay on the eastern side, where we had arrived, and another on the open Pacific side of Catalina Island. We found ourselves caught up in the beginning of the annual Two Harbours Buccaneer Days, a three-day bacchanalia of hijinks based on the theme of what people believe to have been the behaviour of 18th century pirates. Apparently there are hundreds of these colourful celebrations all over the boating world every year, and they are all very much the same. There are contests for all sorts of achievements, the best dressed pirate man, the best and skimpiest dressed pirate woman, the cutest pirate child, toddler and baby, and even the best dressed pirate dog, complete with eye patch. All the boats were festively dressed up too, but all looking very similar. The skull and crossbones flag was flown from every masthead and from every possible flagpole. The overwhelming impression was that every pilot had been hanged and left to rot to skeletal spareness to be displayed on gibbets all over the place. It's impressive how the present day vision of 18th century pirates has been shaped by Robert Louis Stevenson's book Treasure Island or by Johnny Depp's louche hipness as he plays Captain Jack Sparrow. Everywhere the culture of the demon rum prevailed here in Two Harbours, with bottle-clutching buccaneers lurching along their way to join their shipmates in the grog tent. There was loud music from huge speakers on every deck, and even louder music from even bigger speakers at temporary pirate pubs set up on the shore. There were food stalls everywhere selling pirate hamburgers and pirate hot dogs, and one, somewhat more sophisticated, offering authentic French pirate crepes. Everywhere there were uh, overdressed in the California sunshine, false mustachioed sweating pirate men and underdressed lady pirate temptresses. But it was all good, harmless fun. Everyone was in high good humour, and friendliness prevailed, however noisy it might have been. Stuffed parrots were everywhere. The general landscape of Catalina Island has not changed much in thousands, if not millions of years. In the early years of human habitation, uh, certain Aboriginal tribes who lived in villages on the mainland would travel to the islands for fishing and exploration. Eventually, they established small villages here and there are um, archaeological remains of such settlements dating back 10,000 years or so. There are remains all over the island, principally here at the Isthmus and at the present-day Avalon. The people principally mined, worked and traded in soapstone, which is found in large quantities on the island. The first European to set foot here was the Portuguese explorer Juan Cabrillo in about 1542 calling it San Salvador after his ship. Sixty years later, Sebastian Vizcaino, the same Spanish explorer who named Santa Barbara, landed here on the eve of the Feast of St. Catherine and named it Santa Catalina in the saint's honor. During the next 300 years, there came itinerant fishermen, Yankee smugglers and pirates, and Russians from the Aleutian Islands hunting for sea otters, seals and their fur. The Russian Aleuts brought with them nasty diseases which wiped out the local indigenous population who had no immunity to these diseases. It was the same story all over the New World when European explorers came to call. Pirates found that Catalina's abundance of hidden, quiet coves and proximity to the mainland made it a good headquarters and escape hole. Franciscan priests considered opening one of their missions here, but the lack of water and a shrinking population dissuaded them. By the 1830s, the entire population 
had either died or migrated back to the mainland. Santa Catalina was a quiet desert island once more. About 1850, at about the same time as the famous California gold rush, there was a brief flurry of gold mining in Catalina and many claims were staked. Some did find small quantities of gold and, briefly, by 1863, dozens of small boom towns grew up, only to die just as quickly. Finally, all the miners were ordered off the island by the US Union Army, this being during the Civil War, fearing that the Confederate Army might establish a base there. A small garrison of Union troops was established right here at the Isthmus. To this day, there are rumours of gold to be had on Catalina, but probably most of it is in the jeweller's shops in Avalon. By the end of the 19th century, the island was almost completely uninhabited, except for a few cattle herders. It was Sleepy Hollow indeed, just at the same time as Los Angeles, only 20 miles away across the water, was undergoing tremendously rapid expansion. We escaped from the pirate throngs and pirate armadas of two harbours and went back to the still crowded anchorage at the town of Avalon, the largest community on Catalina. It was easy to tell where on earth we were when we found these very patriotically decorated American bald eagles on the seafront. At the end of the 19th century, a real estate speculator by the name of George Chateau bought the whole island for $200,000, an amount of money that wouldn't buy a garden shed there now. Chateau created the settlement that would become Avalon, and he built the town's first hotel, the original Hotel Metropole, and a pier. His sister-in-law came up with the name Avalon, which was taken from Tennyson's poem, Idylls of the Kings, about King Arthur. It had nothing at all to do with the place, but it was a pretty name. Chateau had realized that the booming and rapidly expanding communities of Southern California would need exotic places for people to go for recreation, so he obliged by taking people to Catalina by boats that he provided. For a time, his little tourist mecca enjoyed quite a boom and became very busy. This did not last long, and George Chateau went bust. Next came Phineas Banning, who bought the island in 1891, and his sons fulfilled Chateau's dream of making it a resort. They built a dance pavilion, put up little tent villages for tourists to rent for relatively small amounts of money. He put in a steamer pier for bigger ferry boats and improved the beach. Avalon grew and prospered, until, in 1915, half the town burned down, the First World War led to fewer tourists, and in 1919, the Banning brothers were forced to sell off their shares in the island. Enter William Wrigley, the chewing gum tycoon from Chicago. He bought up a controlling interest in the Santa Catalina Island Company, and he began to run the show. Over the next few years, Avalon expanded enormously. Wrigley encouraged the growth of the resident population. More residences, more hotels, more stores were put in, all controlled by the Wrigleys. A small dance pavilion was built at the northern corner of Avalon Bay, which soon became too small. It was knocked down and the present round iconic structure was opened in 1928. This Art Deco dance hall, called the Catalina Casino, contained a huge dance hall and a theatre. It was the equivalent of 12 storeys high and was, and is, a beautiful example of Art Deco architecture. During the 1930s, Catalina and Avalon thrived. The ferry boats from the mainland were always full and the harbour was always a favourite for visiting private boats. Catalina became even more fashionable when the movie stars of Hollywood began to be seen there, arriving in sumptuous splendor in their private yachts. Catalina and Avalon never looked back. 
It continued to thrive, except for a few years during the Second World War, when the island was closed to tourists and used for military training. The Wrigley family continued to be a great influence on the island's development. They had a finger in every island pie. The Chicago Cubs baseball team, team owned by the Wrigleys, did their annual spring training on Catalina for 30 years during the mid part of the century. Everything was Wrigley this or Wrigley that. In 1975, the Wrigley family deeded all their shares in the Catalina Island Company over to the new Catalina Island Conservancy. And it is this body that controls the island to this day. Nowadays, Avalon is quietly prosperous. Tourists come in large numbers. The theater in the casino enjoys big shows and yachtsmen in their thousands come here from the mainland, principally because there's nowhere else to go. This tower overlooking Avalon is the Bell Chimes Tower, which was presented to the people of Avalon in 1926 by William Wrigley. It rings out loudly and regularly, and the rumor at the time was that it was built exactly here because it was meant to regularly annoy the man who lived just down the street, Zane Grey. The Wrigleys hated Zane Grey for all sorts of reasons. He lived here at this sprawling Hoppy Indian style Pueblo for many years before his death, and it is here that he wrote many of the 100 or so books that he produced during his lifetime. He was best known for his westerns, but he also wrote baseball stories and, being an avid sport fisherman, he wrote many books on this subject too. Over a hundred films were made based on his novels, and in 1924 a film crew came to Avalon to do a film version of one of Gray's books, The Vanishing American. This house that Zane Grey lived in is now a hotel, the Zane Grey Pueblo Hotel, and it must be one of the nicest digs on the island. Zane Grey was a larger-than-life character who believed in living life to the full. He was an indifferent scholar, however, spending most of his time playing baseball, pool and writing poetry. He eventually became a dentist and practiced briefly in New York City, but continued to write in the evenings. He was very much a ladies' man, and his private life became tumultuous and scandalous to those at large. As he became more successful a writer, wealthy and famous, he began to travel a lot. He took up sport fishing and became a legend in that sphere too. He was one of the first writers ever to become a millionaire. So, when he arrived in Avalon to settle for large parts of his time, he brought with him both a famous and an infamous reputation. So this was probably why the staid, conservative Wrigley family hated his guts and built the bell tower simply to annoy him. The Catalina Island Museum is a treasure trove of information on the remote and recent history of Catalina Island. It contains fascinating artifacts of this intriguing place. The museum is housed in this building, the Avalon Casino, the most famous landmark on Catalina. In addition to the museum, it houses a movie theatre and, on the top floor, a dance hall that can accommodate 6,000 dancers. The only thing that this casino does not have is a casino. The building was designed at the height of the Art Deco period of architecture, and this entranceway is a gem of Art Deco design, rivaling the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building and the Rockefeller Center in New York. The theater has a huge pipe organ and shows first-run movies every night. It has perfect acoustics and occasionally produces a live stage show. The iconic Avalon Casino, which can be seen for miles, presides over and dominates the beautiful Avalon Bay. Out on the bay, another cruise ship has arrived, and all day long, small boats have been ferrying passengers back and forth to Avalon Town. These visitors are very welcome to the Catalina Island economy. But, in spite of the crowds on shore, it is relatively peaceful out on the bay even if the anchorage is more congested than most of us yachties are used to. 
This lovely cruising yacht, Jade, belongs to our Dutch friends, whom we have cruised together with for a long time. And this is our beloved trusty boat, Winter Sea, in which vessel we have cruised for years and explored Alaska and all the way down the west coast to this point in our travels. We had one last trip around Catalina and I sat here looking out onto the Pacific and considered what a rewarding voyage we had had so far and particularly here in Santa Catalina Island. We left Catalina Island to cross back to the mainland of Southern California and almost immediately these dolphins joined us as they have many times before. Dolphins are marine mammals closely related to whales and porpoises. Killer whales are their largest close relatives. Dolphins are among the most intelligent animals and their often friendly appearance, which is an artifact of what appears to be a smile on their mouth line, coupled with their apparently friendly behavior, have made them popular animals in human culture. They love to play and are very fast through the water apparently, as here, without any great effort on their part. It is believed that they conserve energy in this way by riding in the bow wave of boats, as these are doing, which enables them to travel further more economically. It's said to be a good luck omen for the boat. After an overnight passage from Catalina, during which we had to take particularly careful watch, because of offshore oil platforms and very heavy shipping traffic, we arrived here in the great harbor of San Diego. The area of San Diego had been occupied by indigenous peoples for 10,000 years before the Spanish explorer Cabrillo arrived in 1542 to be the first European to set eyes on the west coast of what is now the United States. He called the area San Miguel, but it was our old friend, Sebastian Viscaino, who, in 1602, surveyed the area and called it after Saint Didicus, a Spanish saint more commonly known as San Diego. San Diego grew rapidly during the early part of the 20th century, and it developed an increasingly significant naval presence during that time. By 1930, San Diego was host to the naval base San Diego, the, the headquarters of the United States Pacific Naval Fleet. During the Second World War, San Diego became a major hub of military activity and its population doubled during those war years. Post-Cold War cutbacks have had a heavy toll on defense industries here and downtown San Diego was in a steep decline in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. The beautiful climate of San Diego has been its saving grace and the construction of popular theme parks, zoos, convention centers and other attractions has brought in visitors by the million. And of course, close by are the flesh pots of Tijuana. We made our way through the busy shipping traffic of the enormous San Diego Harbor and found for ourselves an anchorage in a lovely, quiet backwater in the small suburban city of Coronado across the bay from San Diego. The anchorage at Glorieta Bay here is a well-kept secret in San Diego. We found ourselves right beside the world-famous Hotel del Coronado, a beachfront luxury hotel the hotel actually lying between our quiet backwater anchorage and the open Pacific and sheltering us from it. The Hotel del Coronado is one of the few surviving examples of an American architectural genre, the wooden Victorian beach resort. It's one of the oldest and largest all wooden buildings in California and was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1977. When it opened in 1888, it was the largest resort hotel in the world and has hosted a string of presidents, royalty and other celebrities from around the world. The hotel has been featured in many books and movies, perhaps the best known being Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. In the movie, the hotel was called the Seminole Ritz. 
It's a very beautiful hotel that has many stories about its famous and infamous guests. One of the stories, as in many tales about these grand old hotels, is of its resident ghost. The ghost, who, of course, has been sighted on and off for over 120 years, is that of Kate Morgan, a 27 years old woman found dead on the steps of the hotel leading down to the beach. She had killed herself with a single shot to the head. She had checked into the hotel in November 1892 without luggage, claiming to be the wife of a doctor who was coming later with the luggage to join her. He never showed up. Thomas Edison, the great inventor, who pioneered the use of electricity in the late 19th century, is alleged to have supervised the installation of all the electric lights during the building of the Hotel del Coronado. And it's probably a self-perpetuating myth that he was present at the switching on of this, the first outdoor electrically lit Christmas tree in 1904. A nice thought, and the myths persist. Whether Thomas Edison did or did not come to the hotel is debatable. But what is not in dispute is that over its 125 years as a fashionable hotel, many of the rich, famous and powerful did come regularly to the Queen of the Sea, as it became known. Great stars of the stage and screen came here to enjoy the climate, particularly in the winter. The increasing importance of the fairly close by Hollywood as a filmmaking centre made the Dell a very popular watering hole. During the period of prohibition between 1920 and 1933, the hotel, due to its close proximity to Mexico, always managed to have an enormous illicit supply of booze and it became increasingly popular to the Hollywood moneyed classes. Over the last 120 years, pretty well every president of the United States, from Benjamin Harrison to Barack Obama, has stayed here. It's one of those places where you have to be seen at least once. These beautiful birds are snowy egrets, the commonest kind of egret in the United States. They are closely allied to the herons, though they are somewhat smaller. When they were not out hunting fish, insects and small reptiles, they were nesting and prancing about in the branches of this lovely tree. At one time, the beautiful plumes of the snowy egret were in great demand by makers of ladies' hats, so much so that the birds' numbers were reduced to dangerously low levels. These egrets and those crazy birds, the pelicans, are the birds which we'll remember from our days on the west coast of the United States. It was the end of October and our time had come to leave San Diego. According to the terms of our ship insurance, we could not sail south of San Diego until after the hurricane season, which was officially November the 1st. So, all of the things we had to do, like fueling up and provisioning having been done, we were well prepared to leave the United States to sail south into Mexico. We left our quiet corner of San Diego Harbor near the Hotel del Coronado and followed this tall ship up the length of this great harbor of San Diego. We passed all the docks, the military air base and the US Navy headquarters. To our right were the tall buildings and the hills of San Diego. There was a heavy heat haze over the city, which is the eighth largest in the United States. We would not see another city of this size for a very long time. Eventually, we sailed out of the narrow harbor entrance and back out onto the boisterous Pacific Ocean. In wonderful sailing conditions, we had an exhilarating day's sail down the southernmost coast of California and, having sailed through a long, dark night with no moon, we finally arrived in Mexico. A totally different world and more adventures to come.